So, on to the subject of microphones and loudspeakers themselves, and the kind of general topic of transducers. Um, um, so let's talk for a second about the uh, sort of <clears throat> what, I, what we can think of as kind of the proto loudspeaker microphone system, um, which is this one right here, nice. right? What, um, what everybody may have grown up with, what we, uh, there's a knot in it, how'd that happen? Uh, what, uh, sometimes called the tin can telephone, right? But um, for some reason, historically, has been referred to as the lover's telephone. <laughs> Right, and in very in very simple way, this thing looks an awful lot like a uh, microphone, loudspeaker, ear kind of a thing, right? That we have this sort of drum, and then hanging off of it is some kind of a wire that could easily be a nerve going to our brain or something like that, right? And we know that the bones uh, that attach to the eardrum are attached roughly in the center of the drum. So there's something about this that's some kind of a real uh, analog of like the real thing, right? It looks an awful lot like a real ear. And these things are surprisingly good. And they only work under certain conditions, right? In this case, the wire has to be tight, right? If the wire is loose, it's not possible for us to sort of impart a vibration on the string very easily because it's too slack. And these things work surprisingly well. Like uh, I was reading about uh, attaching a lover's telephone sort of permanently between two farmhouses that were a couple of miles apart. And these sort of things were apparently were not sort of so uncommon. Uh, with a sort of giant drum that's built into the wall. And you sort of get up onto a chair and you you have to kind of shout into it, but you say, hey, you know, uh, feed the cows or whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> right? And they say, okay, I'll do it. Um, but that's where, and a few years ago, I don't know, does, do you know anyone who was actually involved in this project? Somebody built a lover's telephone across the Bloomfield Bridge uh, over that ravine. Does anyone know who did that? I think Sean Slifer may have had something to do with it. Huh. Mr. Uh, the, the Vinyl Ninja. Um, anyway, yeah, so that's kind of like a, the proto-microphone that sort of led us in a lot of ways to sort of figure out how to make electrical microphones. One of the first microphones we developed around about the turn of the 20th century or a little bit before that was the humble telephone. Right? The telephone sort of contains the entire history of electronic music in a lot of ways. Uh, because it was the first uh, uh, use of microphones in some practical way that led to uh, the possibility of recording and stuff. And there's virtually nothing in a telephone, um, really just a microphone, a loudspeaker, a transformer, and some wire. And that works surprisingly well as long as it's connected to a battery. Um, what am I getting at? Um, and uh, microphones are sort of idealized for certain purposes, right? We have a whole lot of, what kind of micro, we sort of take for granted the sort of presence of microphones and loudspeakers in our lives, and maybe we can talk a little bit about all the locations where we have microphones, not just when we go to see a concert or when we sit in a room and listen to a lecture. Um, but we have sort of tiny microphone, uh, loudspeakers, tiny microphones all over the place, uh, in our cell phones. We're sort of, un we're used to the idea that we're probably under audio surveillance everywhere we go. So there's probably a microphone in the uh, surveillance camera at the uh, ATM machine. I guess ATM machine, it's automatic teller machine. Um, right, so we have microphones that are idealized for certain purposes. The typical microphone that we're sort of used to is the thing that looks like this. This is the one you see on the news, right? Um, but strangely enough, the microphones that are suited for different purposes tend to have different shapes. Like uh, very long microphones can be very directional. Right? Or we can make very small microphones for hiding uh, on, our, on our person, as we say, is this thing on here. So, for instance, this is a, an old, a fairly old uh, lavalier microphone. This was considered a super miniature microphone in its day, which was roughly the early 50s. Uh, nowadays, we build microphones small enough to sort of insert inside our own ears. Um, and this thing works reasonably well. Uh, this is what we would call a, an omnidirectional microphone that hears sort of equally well all the way around it, right? So it hears pretty well on axis and off axis, right? You don't have to be right in front of it. Uh, this thing, surprisingly enough, is super directional. We call this thing a shotgun microphone because it sort of looks like a shotgun. 
and it's directional in a way very similar to that, but we can also sort of make a very primitive shotgun microphone by sticking a microphone in a tube. And what we effectively do is sort of focus the beam of the sound, right? So now this thing's super sensitive right on axis, which it wasn't, right? If I hold it here and I, it's not picking up anymore, right? But simply by sort of focusing the sound acoustically, right, I've created a directional microphone. Uh, one of the other things that we're sort of used to worrying about with microphones is feedback. Right, and if we have a sort of very, uh, let's see, get the feedback is much harder. We really have to be right on axis there. Um, we can actually, uh, is that going to work? We can limit the feedback sort of very carefully. Turn this thing way up. That's not working very much. We turn this up sort of. So feedback is sort of one of the fundamental um, ingredients in electronic music. Electronic music doesn't really work without feedback. It's a slightly different subject. Um, without, f without feedback, sound would be impossible. Um, and we also have microphones that are geared toward, um, well, all those sort of, what are the useful microphones that you're used to? Like, like you've got your bass microphone, the, uh, the bi-directional microphone, the those are all the kind of really ordinary microphones, right? But if you think about it for a second, you sort of see that they're all over the place. Some of them are very small, some of them are very large. You've got the microphones that, um, uh, why would you want a distant microphone, right? To record sounds that are sort of very far away from you for things that you're afraid of, right? Like recording conversations from people, you put a big dish on something to focus the sound. Right, so that you can put people under surveillance, they don't know it, or you're afraid of lions, but you want to record lions, something like that. Um, also, microphones we put inside the body, listen to our bloodstream. Um, we have microphones for listening to the sort of motions of the earth, right? What we call geophones, that we collect seismic data with, and we also have microphones for listening to, th so that's what we call an infrasound microphone, well below our hearing range. And then we've got ones for listening to, where do I have it? Stuff that's well above our frequency range, like this thing here is an ultrasound microphone. Unfortunately, I, uh, I don't have the amplifier with me. But it's, uh, I can pass this stuff around too. Uh, this thing is designed for listening to frequencies well above our hearing range, and it sort of translates the sounds down into a range that we can hear. So we can listen to bats with something like this. And um, it wasn't made for listening to bats, it was made for diagnosing um, faults in high-speed manufacturing equipment, nice. right? That put out a lot of weird ultrasonic vibrations that you don't necessarily hear with your ears, but that you would uh, detect with an ultrasound microphone. So it was like a diagnostic tool. Um, so the plain old microphone, uh, which we'll sort of concentrate on, is basically some kind of, remember I said the microphone is sort of an analog of the human ear, right? It has a lot of characteristics similar to the human ear, so we can think of it as some kind of a diaphragm, some kind of a drum. Any of you ever played in a band where there's a bass player and a drummer? I knew somebody was going to say yes. Um, and you've got that part where uh, somebody hits a particular bass note and the snare on the drum goes... Right? So the drum, the head of the drum in that case is acting as a kind of very sensitive microphone to a very particular frequency, and it vibrates in sympathy, sort of especially well at that particular frequency causing the snare to vibrate. Uh, microphones, and, uh, sort of ordinary microphones, what we call, uh, we'll just call them air microphones, operate on a very simple, similar principle. So you've got a giant, uh, well not giant, but you've got a diaphragm it's basically a cone uh, looking an awful lot like the human ear. And then wrapped around the, the base of that cone is a fine coil of wire whose ends sort of go out into the world. And that's what this thing does right here, right? This is a loudspeaker, but it's also uh, can be thought of as a sort of model for the microphone, just a much, much, much larger one. Can you guys see that okay? So in cross-section, it looks very much like this, of electromagnetism 
when a coil is moved in the presence of a permanent magnet, it generates a little bit of electricity. And that's just the way it is. Um, so, any time this diaphragm is caused to move, the coil, which is permanently attached to it, vibrates around the magnet and it makes a little bit of electricity. Tiny, tiny little bit of electricity, sort of that big, which we then apply to amplifiers and be uh, becomes a useful signal. Is the magnet absolutely necessary? The magnet is absolutely necessary. Uh, at least if we want it to function as a conventional microphone. Yeah. Um, without the, it, it's because it's an electromagnetic <coughs> microphone. It has to, uh, has to, it has to be in the presence of a permanent magnet in order to generate uh, a little bit of electricity. And so this makes a small signal, which we sort of amplify and uh, put to our purposes. This effect is completely reversible as well, so that if we feed an electrical signal into those wires, right, it would cause a, a movement in the coil, um, a movement in the coil which is attached to the cone, which makes the cone vibrate and pushes the air. Around. Right? Does that make sense? So we can take the microphone, the basic idea of the microphone, and reverse it and actually use that loudspeaker as a microphone. So now we've got this sort of uh, much more sensitive thing, right? <laughs> and, um, uh, so, yeah, we can see every time I, I can use this as a microphone simply by pushing on it, right? And I generate a signal simply by rubbing it. I can really make the cone go nuts that way. Because every time the coil moves within the field of that magnet, it starts to generate a voltage. And it generates a vibrating voltage when it's caused to vibrate, but it generates a static voltage if it's just a one-way pressure, right? Remember, the sound has to vibrate. So the kind of vibrations of my voice cause the diaphragm to vibrate and making a signal that's more or less uh, in tune with my voice. But this is a, an exceptionally bassy microphone, right? And it looks an awful lot different from this. Why don't we use these kind of things for? Why don't we use these kind of things for microphones? This is a very bassy microphone, right? Um, we can. Uh, we very often build microphones of this type for uh, use on bass drums. Like the standard uh, home studio will build a bass microphone simply by taking a, a cheap loudspeaker and connecting wires to it because it picks up bass frequencies better than something else. Mm, I like that. Uh, and so the thing also sort of functions as a, uh, a microphone for listening to uh, sounds through materials, right? It's idealized for listening to sound through the air, right? But it also does a pretty good job of listening to sounds through, through materials. Excuse me. And we, all, we don't just, uh, we take it for granted that we listen to sounds through the air, but we actually listen to them through a lot of other stuff too, right? Like you, uh, who listens to music through their pillow? Come on, I know you all do. Who listens to their neighbors? By putting their ear up against the wall? Or with a glass. glass. With a glass against the wall, right? You go, you listen to the neighbors, you don't know what they're doing, right? Uh, or to your parents, or you listen to trees, or telephone poles, or something like that. Um, or you listen to sort of rubber bands pushed up against your head, you know, and you go, right? What you're doing in that, no, but I'm, I, every time I do that, everyone says, what's that? I never do that. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, so when we do that, we're listening through solid materials, and a lot of the time uh, when we listen to sounds, we actually listen to them through solid materials, and we take that for granted. Like our own voices, for instance, we listen to uh, at least partially through the bones in our own head. Uh, because our uh, voice boxes are down here, we don't just have the sound sort of exit our mouths and then come around and make our ears uh, vibrate through here. We cause the rest of the bones in our head to vibrate because our basic vibrating apparatus is right here, which causes our jaws to vibrate, which are attached to the bones in our ears, and then we hear through our ears, right? Um, and it's also why your voice sounds different to you uh, than it does to other people if you listen to recordings of yourself. You're used to listening to your sound inside your head, not just the sort of <coughs> philosophical sound in your head, but literally the sound of the bones in your head vibrating. So when you listen to a recording of yourself, you don't really sound like yourself. Um, <coughs> uh, and we also have microphones uh, that are sort of idealized for listening to sounds through materials. So we call microphones of this type, this is sort of general 
we generally distinguish microphones one from another by either their, their type of uh, working method uh, or their application, right? So we would call this kind of a microphone by working method, we call this an electrodynamic loudspeaker. That's kind of because it operates on an electromagnetic principle. But in terms of its um, application, we call this an air microphone because it captures sound through the air and that's what it's kind of made for. When we use it in reverse, we call it a loudspeaker or a dynamic loudspeaker. Um, other kinds of microphones, and this sort of very typical kind of microphone designed for uh, listening to sound, sounds through solid objects, we refer to as a contact microphone because it's idealized for listening to uh, sounds through hard materials but not through the air. And this particular kind of microphone uh, works by the working method of what we call uh, piezoelectricity which is a fancy word for uh, materials that generate electricity when they are bent, right? Uh, so the microphone itself is this little blue dot right here, a tiny little piece of brass with a, a chip of a particular kind of a crystal material on it, who's uh, got the unique physical properties that when it bends, it generates a small voltage. And if we bend it ever so slightly, simply by pinching it, we can make an excursion here, right? And uh, if we sort of shout into it from a distance, it doesn't really do anything, right? It's not really sort of coupled to the air very well. It doesn't accept vibrations in the air very well. But what it is sort of very suited for is uh, listening to materials through solids, and that's why we call it a contact microphone. If we tape it to the table, what if you put it on your neck? What if you put it on your neck? You can put that thing on your neck and you can listen right directly to your voice. Right? And you can... Uh, I can drink a glass of water. <laughs> right? And so we're amplifying sort of directly the vibrations of my vocal cords. Right? We can tape it to the table. table sort of suddenly becomes alive and we can listen to all kinds of materials through the table right? uh, amplifying simple springs who make virtually no sound in the air whatsoever but yeah, that's sort of more pleasant than this other than that. Uh, and so microphones of that type are useful not just for sort of making sound effects for movies and your crazy projects, uh, but also for all kinds of really practical purposes. Like uh, one of the things there. Uh, oh, sorry. That's a little, that's the wire. Uh, one of the things uh, they can be used all over. First of all, they're very small, so we can put them in sort of tiny places. These are the kind of microphones we generally tend to insert into our bodies. Right? Um, we can um, put them in water because they're basically waterproof. So we can, um, let's see if I can do this well. Where's the little clip? So I can. Um, right? So we can listen to not just ourselves drinking Coke, um, but also to um, things that live in the water, for instance, like. Uh, these kind of microphones were fundamental in the development of uh, sonar systems, for instance, so that we could actually hear sound. We send sounds out and then be able to detect them later. We also listen to fish and stuff like that with these kinds of mics. I can play some. I made a lot of recordings with uh, uh, tiny insects in ponds and stuff like that. We can take microphones and uh, of this type and insert them into. Uh, we can bury them in the ground, stick them into gopher holes. Like that. Uh, one of the sort of the, the, one of the most interesting things about I think this kind of work is that we're sort of sensing information in the environment, not really creating it. Right? It's sort of like a, a much more exploratory sort of a thing. Um, and these kinds of materials, uh, which we are using as microphones to sense vibrations, uh, can also be. Uh, used in reverse, 
let me first sort of demonstrate. Uh, so this thing is sort of poorly coupled to the air, though, I want to say, right? Like it doesn't, it doesn't listen to sound in the air very well. But the moment I attach it to something that, where's my clip? Um, the moment I attach it to something that kind of does act as a diaphragm, I can use that thing as a microphone, right? As an air microphone, I can simply talk into it because I'm making the can vibrate now, right? So I've simply got a clip there. And it's uh, picking up the sound of my voice reasonably well, although I sound like I'm talking through a tin can. <laughs> right? But uh, that's the basic principle, right? We've got something that really only hears sound well through its surfaces, but we're causing its surface to vibrate because it's attached to something a lot more sort of flexible and soft, some kind of a membrane that looks a lot like the membrane of an ear or something like that. Uh, and these things work just like the. Uh, just like this kind of a transducer that works well in reverse, which is to say it takes sounds well and it gives sounds well. Water in the north, Kim. So, what we've done is we've taken one of these contact microphones now and we've fed it a signal instead of okay so here it is if everybody's really quiet they can listen to this tiny little loudspeaker can you hear that sort of very vaguely right so it's kind of a it seems like a perfectly useless device right the idea of a loudspeaker is generally that we want to fill a room with sound but do we really always do that right a lot of the loudspeakers we use are really very small like um, the ones that we put in our ears, right? We're always walking around with headphones on, and those are really sort of tiny loudspeakers. They don't really need to be really loud, very loud. I can probably hold this thing up to my ear reasonably well. Uh, these are the kind of microphones we uh, see sort of more and more often now in places like cell phones and stuff like that because they're very small. And it does a lousy job of pushing the air around until we attach it to some kind of um, material. So the moment I attach it to some kind of thing that can actually push the air around, just like a simple piece of trash, right? Now it's the job of the, uh, the, this membrane to set the air into vibration, and that will work with just about anything, whether it's. Uh, yeah, this works pretty well. Right, that's really loud because this thing is starting to look more and more like a conventional loudspeaker in this case, right? Like we can, um, where did I have that? We can make a, oh, we'll do it like this. Just make a simple paper cone, right? And this thing sort of turns into a cannon for sound, right? Um, these are the kind of loudspeakers we see in um, greeting cards, for instance. When you open up the greeting card and you hear that little song, and there's a, a little card that's attached to one of these little piezos, you open the thing up and you hear, you hear the voice of Jesus or whatever. <laughs> um, the other thing these things work uh, really well for is to uh, vibrate other solid materials um, like uh, the bones in your head. A lot of people who are hard of hearing are hard of hearing because their eardrums are damaged. Right? But the, the hearing mechanism past the eardrum, all the little bones and the cochlea and stuff still work reasonably well. So if you can get those bones to vibrate by attaching the, the, the vibrator somewhere to the bones in your head, then you're sort of halfway there. Like if you bite on it, you get a really loud sound. Right? And this was a, sort of an early development in the history of uh, hearing aids, what they called bone conduction hearing aids, where people were able to... Uh, improve their hearing simply by having a device to bite on when they wanted to actually hear, which is a little bit annoying uh, by our today's standards, but uh, bone conduction hearing aids these days take the form of having something sort of drilled into the bones in your head and permanently mounted there to sort of make your eardrums vibrate by mechanical means. But if you guys want to sort of come up and actually bite down on this and listen to it, it's really sort of spectacular. The whole head will fill up with sound. You guys are that, you guys are, come on. I, Does it come with a dental dam? Uh, <laughs> we can, uh, we can, yeah, you can, need a dam. You can uh, wrap it in paper or something like that, yeah. your chicken. It works better with braces. 
Isn't that incredible? Your whole head fills up with sound. You guys are totally missing your bunch of <laughs> missing out. Passive, passive. Are you kidding? There's only one person in the group who wants to do that. Isn't that incredible? Can you hear? It? Can you hear it? I mean, I can hear. It. Well, we can hear it better when you do that. Yeah, yeah. I can your, hear it. your 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 vocal, your mouth sort of does function as a little bit of an amplifier to the outside world, but basically it's just the bones in your head. You can hear it. It's almost deafening. Isn't that incredible? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the other half of the whole uh, 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 getting uh, sound in and out of the box, right? We take for granted the loudspeakers sort of reproduce things perfectly. This thing doesn't reproduce things perfectly, right? Um, we're having a very hard time getting away from loudspeaker design that looks like this. Um, uh, but there are a lot of other options. Like we have, uh, where do I have one? These things right here that I have attached to the table is another kind of a vibrator. Right? Instead of having something that we can bite on to listen to, um, this isn't working very well. Uh, what I have, it doesn't couple the table. This table is really stiff. I'm going to use this one instead. Um, we have a kind of a. So now what we're doing. So what, the business end of this thing. Stop doing that. Okay. Um, the business thing of this thing is like a loudspeaker without a cone. Okay. So it's still got that coil like uh, these things do, and it's still got the permanent magnet. But what it doesn't have is the cone to push around, and instead it has a sort of a screw attachment for touching some, uh, attaching some other kind of a piston to it, right? Some other kind of a thing to vibrate the air. And in this case, I've just attached a, a symbol to sort of show you how unflat, sort of how un, uh, low fidelity a reproduce or something like this can be, right? So we have this kind of ringing quality to the sound. Well, how have you gotten by up till now? Uh, Robert Peter, St. Paul. Jason Bill, every month. So when the sound goes off, <laughs> it takes forever to actually decay. <laughs> right? This is uh, this sort is, of is my wages. not what we sort of ask for in our loudspeakers most of the time, right? We get annoyed by loudspeakers like that, but with musical applications, there's really no reason that our loudspeakers have to be like that at all, right? And in the early days of loudspeaker design, we were a lot more flexible about stuff like that. The um, early loudspeakers for instruments like the Theremin, <coughs> right, were not simple uh, high fidelity reproducers like this. They had big pieces of, uh, big plates of metal that were vibrated by vibrators very much like this one, so that they did sing, right? It was a musical instrument. Or they would have loudspeakers that were like this, and then they'd attach numerous springs to them. Right? So that the thing had some kind of a resonance to it. Or they would make them out of slate or out of cardboard or out of all kinds of other materials because they don't want they didn't want an instrument that sounded the same with every single sound that you put into it. Right? The loudspeaker is an instrument very much uh, the way the microphone's an instrument or very much the way a lot of bass guitar is an instrument or a drum, right? The materials um, matter. Uh, and so once you sort of realize that a lot of these kinds of devices uh, work sort of forwards and backwards, you can do uh, simple tricks like, where's the next? So, you can take something like what we're used to doing, where we take, <coughs> so we, what we were doing before, I will use this one as So we've got another little contact microphone here, in this case with an alligator clip on it. And we're going to listen to that one. Okay. So right now it's simply attached. And we'll maybe stick this down onto the table. 
And so that's just it sort of vibrating all by itself. But if we, instead of just listening to that, send it a signal through a localized vibrator instead of something else. So we take this one. What are we going to listen to with it? Let's see. The right one. All right. So this is the one. So that's the talk radio again, right? So it's coming out of this tiny little vibrating piezo disc here, and we'll attach that on the top end to sort of set the spring into motion. have now is a kind of a simulated space, right? So let's be clear about what's happening, right? We're listening to uh, vibrations through a spring, but the vibrations are being sent th into the spring by an external signal, which comes in this case from talk radio. It's probably. a homemade spring reverb. It's a, it's a very simple kind of a, uh, a homemade reverb device, right? So. Um, why does reverb work uh, in a slinky with a couple of contact microphones, right? Why is it that we can sort of sound like a big concert hall? What is it that they sort of share in common with the actual acoustics of a, of a giant concert hall? Because this is a completely artificial situation. A, 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 this is a slinky junior. Um, slinky junior is clearly not a concert hall, right? It's a coiled piece of metal. But it shares something in common with the concert hall, and that's what? Right. It's the ability to sort of reflect sound around. When, you, when you're in a big fat concert hall, uh, the reason the sound bounces around is because the walls are hard, uh, the space is large, the walls are hard and the uh, surfaces are generally parallel. Just like when you're singing in the shower, the sound sort of bounces around because you have parallel walls that are made out of really hard material, which means that when a sound hits it, it bounces right off, hits another hard material, bounces back. Right? And as that, that energy slowly dissipates over time, and the reflections start to sort of smooth out. Right? So the reflections continue for a long time, and they have a hard time dying away. Right? And the same thing happens in this spring. If you set some vibration into this, like let's, uh, so let's just not drive it for a second and just, I flick it ever so gently. And that sound has a very long time before it dies away. So any vibration that's sent into there is going to take a, quite a while before the reflections stop. And if we want, we can artificially dampen that thing. You can still hear the sound, right? Let's okay, shorten it. So we can shorten the reverb time. Simply by shortening the duration, that doesn't work quite as well because the other stuff is still allowed to vibrate. There, so I'm sort of artificially dampening the vibration simply by holding it still. Um, so this is very when we dampen the vibrations by simply making it uh, making it harder for the spring to sort of wobble around endlessly. It's exactly the same thing that we do by putting carpet on the walls in our practice space, right? We're sort of reducing the number of reflections by putting materials there that actually absorb the reflections instead of encouraging them. So it's a sort of very direct analogy, and that's one of the interesting things about I'm trying to sort of harp on at least is the uh, relationships between. Microphone, electrical signals and microphones in the real world is that there's always a kind of very direct physical correlation, right? You can sort of see damping in a spring as an exact analogy to something like damping the walls by putting up curtains or cardboard or uh, uh, mattresses that you still have tracking. <laughs> All right, so that's a little bit about the whole subject of contact microphones sending vibrations through materials. We still have a few other types that are sort of worth looking at because we're not just 
sensing information that are vibrations in the air that we're picking up sort of acoustically by vibrations um, in a string or something like that. We're also picking up in sort of other more peculiar ways, like uh, microphones that look something like this. You guys recognize this thing? Now say it loud and proud. A guitar pickup. A guitar. Very good. <laughs> Go to the head. Uh, so a microphone like this is a, a very particular type. Let's see if we can listen to that. Um, doesn't really function well by. It doesn't really get vibrations through the air very well. Is this thing even on? Yeah. Is this thing? Yeah. Right. Okay. So I can tap it a little bit and just by making it vibrate a little bit. But it's basically not really a contact microphone. It's not really an air microphone. But what it does do very well, or does it do anything very well? Is this thing broken? There we go. Is it picks up guitar strings because it knows rock and roll when it hears it? Or why is it that, why is it, that it picks up the vibrations of guitar strings but doesn't pick up the sound of my voice, right? Huh? It's metal moving. Well, it's not the frequency because I can boom, 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 and it's not listening to me, right? It's not that it likes particular frequencies better than others. It's something about guitar strings. It's something about like enough rock for one hand or however that goes. Uh, well, does it work well with like uh, straws? No, not really. Right? Uh, what it, a microphone of this type works on a uh, principle of. Um, very similar to the. Hmm? It's half a microphone. It's basically a half a microphone, right? So what we have instead, well, it's a whole microphone that just sort of needs to be completed. Very similar to the loudspeaker microphone thing that we just diagrammed. What we have is another magnet, and in this case, we wind the thing with a zillion coils of wire, and we have its two wires coming off. Uh, so it's like a loudspeaker or a microphone without the cone part, right? So in order for, remember what we said was if you have a, a change in the motion of the coil that it's going to generate a little bit of electricity when there's a magnet in the middle of it. But if instead we have a metal string over here that, but this stuff is fixed, this stuff can't move, right? So if instead what we have here is a vibrating string that's kind of vibrating like that, what we're doing is changing the magnetic field by bringing a, uh, by having a, a metal string in the presence of a coil, and that generates a small electrical signal, and we use that and amplify it. So the string has to be uh, uh, a magnetic uh, kind of material. It won't work with plastic strings. It won't work with uh, strings that don't contain any kind of a metal. And we can use those things to sense not just uh, vibrations in the uh, in uh, uh, things like strings, but also, uh, let's see if I can listen to some other sound here. Um, we can listen to uh, our computers and stuff. Uh, kind of magnetic uh, pickups that uh, look uh, tiny like this. Does anyone recognize this thing? It's from a tape player. Yeah, it's a tape head. And these things in one form or another, now the, the, the guitar pickup, which we see on a lot of our uh, musical instruments, is kind of a, 
has a very large field of sensitivity, right? So we can vibrate things pr pretty far away from it and it still picks up. Um, the uh, tape head has a much more focused sort of field of uh, sensitivity. It's really only in a very narrow area where it actually senses anything. I have too many things on this table. Um, so if I'm very, very careful. Right, so if I'm very careful, I can, I can use this as a kind of a guitar pickup too if I wanted to. It operates on exactly the same principle. It needs something metal sort of with a changing field in front of it in order to sense anything. But this is the basic idea that we still use in things like our hard drives. Um, we still are writing information on our hard drive with tiny little magnetic heads that aren't writing analog information, they're writing digital information, and we still encode that kind of information in places like, who's got a credit card or something? Uh, so, so we can sort of read Kyle's personal information. <laughs> We, so uh, this will sound different depending on the uh, rate. At, this, is, this isn't entirely obvious. What, what's, on a, what's on a magnetic strip in a California ID card or any other piece of magnetically coded information are uh, millions of tiny little magnets, right? That's what magnetic, we don't use an awful lot of magnetic tape anymore for sound recording, but it works in exactly the same way. But there are zillions of tiny little magnets, and what we do is re reorganize them in ways that are permanent and we sort of shift their little domains, they're aligned in different ways. And when we uh, read them, the rate at which we read, oh wait, there's something nice here. Yeah, there's a nice. Right. It's probably like this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the frequency of reading affects the frequency of playback, right? The information is written at a particular speed and it's also uh, read at a particular speed, and so it will change depending on the, the reading speed, which is basically the same thing you do with a phonograph. What does mine sound like? <laughs> Alabama. <laughs> Alabama. <laughs> yeah, they do the same thing. <laughs> probably in this here at the tip. All right, so uh, maybe we'll end with a bang. Do we want to simulate a record player? Yeah. yeah. Yes. All right, uh, or maybe we do something optically? Do something optically. Okay, so what we have here or maybe this one here, is a, a, a kind of an optical microphone, right? Uh, on the end of this thing, can you guys see this okay? What this is is a sort of, here, throw it out into the room. Catch. And if we amplify, what this thing, it's basically a solar cell. Okay, so if you hold it without performing it, it's not all about your needs. Uh, without performing it, it's sort of making sound all by itself. Just hold it up. <laughs> it's these days. I haven't seen one. It's trouble. Um, so it's really, it's really just a, a, a solar cell, like the kind that we would use to charge our um, uh, whatever it is that we charge. Yeah. Um, calculator. Calculator. Right. And so the reason we're hearing a hum now. Uh, even though we're not really sending in any useful information, is because it's coming from these lights, which are actually turning on and off uh, 60 times a second. So whoever's standing near that door could turn the lights out. That works pretty well. There you go. Wait, so I had a flashlight here. It disappeared. Okay, so here's my flashlight. So when we turn on all the lights, this thing is really dead silent because the sun is DC. The sun is sort of non-varying. Let me bring it closer. But if we sort of flashlight very rapidly on it, it sort of gently creates a signal, right? And if we chalk the signal to it with a simple, I don't know, you guys probably can't see it. Mm -hmm. So if I chalk the signal that's feeding it, right, if it just gets the DC from the, the single continuous light that isn't switching on and off from the lamp, it doesn't make a sound, but the moment we chop the light, it starts to make a sound sort of at the frequency of uh, the chopping of the fan. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? Uh, you could hit the lights maybe. No, wait, no, don't hit the lights. We'll do it with this little thing because it's quieter. Okay. So that basic idea where we're using an optical sensor, let's see if I can listen to this one. Okay, so now we're using a different 
a different one that's right here, mounted on the table. And instead of uh, listening to table lamps, we will send a signal from a laser beam. There. OK, can you guys see this laser? Yeah. Right, there's this little red laser. You can come closer to it. This is such a large group, everybody's really laid back. So we have a tiny little laser pointer here, right, sending a beam across the table to a sensor over here. And we can chop that laser beam up very simply with a battery and a fan again. Where can we? There we go. Right, and we have a very simple kind of an optical synthesizer in this case. Right, simply sort of chopping the light at different frequencies and generating sound that way by taking DC, sort of a permanent state, and making it fluctuate very rapidly simply by chopping the light. That in itself is sort of moderately thrilling, but if instead of doing that, instead of changing the intensity of the light by turning it on and off, just chopping it, we can send it, let's see if this is going to work, do it, do it, why aren't you, there we go. Why will be gone forever? In their tax, we make it more difficult for companies to So what we're doing in this case, let's see where the light's on, is we actually uh, we're using a signal to vary the intensity of the laser simply by, you have to believe me that this is because there's so many wires on this table, but there's a single wire that's basically feeding an input into this laser coupled into the uh, battery circuit of the laser. So all I'm really doing is adding a little bit of audio voltage on top of the battery voltage that's already there. So I'm uh, changing the intensity of the light of the laser with the signal from the radio. We're guy Carmen Angelo with an FM News Talk. And yeah, sending it across the room. Pennsylvania yeah. state government Switch reporting some good news. So when I interrupt the beam. More than two years, Governor Ed Rendell. The sound doesn't get to its receiver. And this is a very simple kind of a light transmitter for sound. Right? So I can send pretty much any signal I want. Largely driven by corporation tax revenues that were $53 million ahead of schedule. Uh, send any sound I want across the room and we can send it sort of arbitrarily long. I could, let's see if we can actually do it. So you can go all the way to the end of the, we'll see how far you can go. Go until I tell you to stop because the wire is going to be tight. Okay, so right about there is about good. So she's the receiver right now and there's nothing feeding her. So what we have to do is find a way that you have to stand really still because we have to aim the laser right at you. <laughs> all right, so we're aiming at sort of yeah. We're aiming it roughly at the center of your chest there, so that it'll be easy to find. All right, so now you try to, I'm, we're all adults here. Um, so now what I want you, you have to pick up the sensor and try to uh, interrupt the beam with it. You, can you see it right there on your hand? Mm -hmm. So now turn the sensor out so that it's actually facing me. No, I like it. I like it. I like it. So we can send this sort of signal arbitrary. Right. <laughs> I did this sort of a demonstration recently for a, a bunch of drummers, and they just came over and they were like. <laughs> right. Okay, that's good. Thank you. I mean, you've been a big room lights on, please. Uh, and uh, so that's a kind of simple way to send sound across a room that's coded, but on the subject of chopping, we can actually uh, encode sound optically onto discs like this one. I don't know if you guys can see this, maybe a little bit of contrast, but uh, we sort of ran, ran out of time. Maybe I'll do this another time. But these are uh, sounds that are encoded optically the way a, a film soundtrack works. And we can read them in precisely the same way that we just send sound across the room to Andrea standing there. We just shine a laser beam through it, put a sensor underneath, and we're able to have a kind of a primitive sampler. Right? What is that format? Uh, this was a, a, sh a very short-lived uh, toy called the Optigan made by the Mattel company in the mid-1970s for about three years. But the basic idea of it is that it's a, 
an optical soundtrack, just like film soundtrack, which we're still doing optically. Right. So in many ways, uh, these sort of technologies are all, uh, you could think of them as old or old-fashioned, but none of them are really out of date, and they're all sort of really underneath. Uh, the principles are so simple that they're not really going to die. Right? They sort of take advantage of very simple, um, simple characteristics of materials. The loudspeaker isn't going away anytime soon, and neither is the microphone.